Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on democracy, uh, rule of law, and authoritarian populism, a postcard for, from Europe. This seminar, I'm Cristina Fassone from Luis Guido Carli, and uh, this seminar is the uh, occasion to discuss and present uh, two important books that have been recently published. Um, one co-authored by Matej Avelli and Jerny Letnar Czernic uh, on the impact of European institutions and the rule of law uh, on the rule of law and democracy, Slovenia and beyond. Um, and uh, the second one, this is published by Art um, in the uh, book series on EU law in the member states. And the uh, second book is an edited collection. Uh, on Italian populism and constitutional law, strategies, conflicts, and dilemmas, to which I've also had the uh, pleasure to contribute. And this is edited by Giacomo delle Donne, Giuseppe Martinico, uh, Matteo Monti, and Fabio Pacini, published in the framework of the Palgrave book series on challenges to democracy in the 21st century. This uh, uh, webinar uh, is uh, co organized by uh, STALS. Euractiv uh, Italy, uh, SES EU, uh, New University uh, in Slovenia, and uh, uh, Diritti Comparati. And this event is part of the Jean Monnet project uh, We EU, Noi Europei. And there is also participation uh, um, of the uh, Slovenian Research Agency, which has supported the publication of the book by uh, Matei uh, and Jerny. You can uh, um, uh, follow and share uh, this event uh, um, uh, on the Facebook page uh, of Diritti Comparati. And uh, uh, without further ado, uh, we will enter immediately uh, into the uh, discussion. Just let me say uh, that uh, it's very important in my view that we are discussing this book together. They are to some extent complementing each other, one focused uh, on uh, uh, a founding member state of the European Union, another one on a country of more recent accession, neighboring states. And their perspective is slightly different because one is focused on uh, populism, but there is, uh, um, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the book, uh, I think, an important reflection also on how populism can lead to rule of law uh, problems and democratic backsliding. Um, the, the European Union uh, uh, lies in the background of the book, while uh, the book by uh, Matei and Jerny is uh, um, more focused on the impact uh, of the European Union on uh, uh, rule of law and democratic backsliding, potentially. Uh, I must say that uh, while I'm more familiar with the Italian system, I've really learned a lot uh, uh, on the Slovenian constitutional system and the challenges that is facing thanks to uh, Matei and Gerny's book. But also to some extent, the populism in this case uh, is in the background on this book. So I think that um, uh, discussing them together is, uh, um, is very fruitful. Uh, so looking forward to it, and uh, I will immediately introduce uh, uh, our first speaker, Matej Avelli, who is Professor of uh, European Law at New University Slovenia, for its presentation. So Matej, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Cristina, for this very nice uh, presentation. Thank you very much for moderating this event. Uh, I'm really happy to be participating in it uh, with all the colleagues and friends. Uh, we have all had a, a very fruitful history of collaboration uh, in the past. And now in this uh, slightly unusual times, uh, I'm also happy that we are joining our forces uh, online uh, in this webinar. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, Cristina, we have indeed recently published this book, uh, which is examining the impact uh, of the European institutions, that is the institutions both of the European Union and of the Council of Europe, uh, on the uh, state of the rule of law and uh, democracy, um, first of all and foremost um, in our book in Slovenia, but also beyond uh, contextualizing uh, the Slovenian case study uh, in a broader uh, context of what we have known as 
or what has been known as constitutional or democratic uh, backsliding. Uh, it is uh, quite a, ours is it's quite a big book, and uh, since I have uh, only a few minutes uh, to to introduce it, I decided to pick um, just a few elements uh, out of it. Let me first of all start with the with the grand idea uh, against which uh, this book is actually uh, built. Uh, our book. Uh, starts with a with a benchmark idea of constitutional democracy. So whatever else is going on in Slovenia and other uh, states that we are examining in the book, we are measuring the actual practices against the standards, the ideals of constitutional democracy. And I think it is important also for today's debate to define what we actually mean by constitutional democracy. And here we draw on a Habermasian definition. Habermas has defined constitutional democracy as a paradoxical union of contradictory principles of democracy on the one hand side that deals with sovereignty, the people, the majority, and on the other side, the rule of law that is interested in the protection of individuals, procedural safeguards, also the protection of uh, minorities. So the entire book is written against this ideal, and as we have been writing, we insisted that constitutional democracy requires robust institutions, it requires checks and balances, it requires a political space which is pluralist, it requires a media space which is also pluralist, and it requires economic spectrum, an economic system which is diverse, uh, this with the dispersed private ownership and all in all i think this also requires the existence of vibrant and diverse civil society so this is a kind of benchmark against which we have been measuring slovenia and i think we are all measuring other member states uh, in the european union and the more this discrepancy between the actual practices out there and the ideal is um, broadening, the, the bigger there is this discrepancy, the bigger the, there is a, the, um, a gap between the ideal and uh, practice, uh, the more we can speak about constitutional backsliding or, uh, as I would also use the term, uh, decay of constitutional democracy. So this would be my first point, to, to make clear what we actually mean by constitutional democracy that we use as a benchmark for writing uh, this book. Second important point that I would like to advance today about this book is that we are arguing that the, the aforementioned democratic decay can happen in two different manners. Democratic constitution, the a decay of constitutional democracy can happen in an overt manner or it can happen in a covert manner. And I think so far in the European Union, when we have been speaking about uh, constitution, um, constitutional backsliding, democratic backsliding, decay of constitutional democracy, we have been um, focusing most on the overt manner of, uh, of constitutional backsliding. An overt manner happens uh, and requires a complete institutional overhaul. It requires sometimes changing of the constitution. It requires hijacking of the institutions. It requires putting your own loyalists into every possible and imaginable uh, position uh, in the state. It requires uh, capturing of the economy as well as the civil society. And when this is done, in, when this, all this has to be done, it's usually done in an overt manner. And in, when it's done in this overt manner, this also calls for a justification, for a narrative that legitimizes this practice. And the narrative that has been legitimizing this practice in the actual cases of, in, of overt constitutional backsliding uh, in the European Union has been the narrative of populism, as scholars and other observ observers have, uh, have described it. So I think uh, the most outspoken examples of overt constitutional backsliding, backsliding are nowadays Hungary and Poland. And we have heard an, uh, a lot about these two countries. However, uh, people have heard much less about a uh, covert manner of constitutional backsliding. And we are arguing in this, in this book of ours that Slovenia is such a case. So now, what is now in conceptual terms uh, a covert manner of uh, constitutional backsliding? A covert manner of constitutional backsliding, it is characteristic of it that it takes place over a longer span of time. 
It takes place incrementally uh, over decades. And for that reason, since it's taking place for such a, over, over such a long period of time, it, it carries with it, it establishes the aura of normality. And when these covered practices are taking this um, are taking place in this in, in such a, in, in such a manner, there is no need to change the the institutions fundamentally. There is no need for a complete institutional overhaul overnight. There is no need to place your own loyalists in all the institutions of the state, of the civil society, to capture the economy overnight, because this is taking place in a longer period of time in a covert manner, also using much less brutal means. It can be done in a softer, uh, in a softer manner, it requires no grand uh, narrative. It doesn't it require investing into a, in, into a populist narrative. All it requires is that the system produces just enough output legitimacy that everyone is somehow satisfied in this, uh, in this process. And this process is then also very nicely fed by all sorts of kleptocratic practices where those in power who have covertly uh, subdued uh, the, the institutions in the, sta in the state were be have been able to dividend the impera between the produces of such, uh, of such product. So uh, in this, the, the argument of, the, of this book, um, Inter Alia, is that while we, there, that there are many faces of constitutional backsliding in contemporary Europe, especially in post-communist um, member states. And then we have to distinguish between the overt and covert manners of constitutional backsliding, of decaying, of capturing uh, the state. And while those covert practices are much more visible, uh, over, sorry, overt prax uh, practices are much more visible, much more transparent. They might be also much more aggressive. It is not necessary that they're actually also more harmful in practice. Because in terms of covert practices, and I'll be done in a second, they're much less visible. They have been taking place over a longer period of time it's much more difficult to make them transparent, to tell a story about them. And it's, so it's also much more difficult to draw critical attention to these kind of cases. And if it's more difficult to draw attention to this kind of case, critical attention to these kind of cases, it might be also more difficult to repair a constitutional democracy that has been captured in a covert manner than the one that has been captured in an overt manner. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matei, also for uh, being very precise on the time and for clarifying for these conceptual clarifications, which are very important, and in particular, this uh, covert manner of reaching uh, constitutional uh, uh, decay, which is apparently uh, not uh, uh, maybe equally harmful as uh, for the overt manner in which uh, uh, constitutional democracy can uh, uh, suddenly disappear. Um, now is the floor, is the time for uh, uh, Giacomo uh, Delle Donne uh, to step in. He's a um, postdoctoral fellow in comparative public law at um, Sant'Anna uh, in Pisa, uh, and uh, he will uh, talk about the other book. Thanks, Giacomo. Thank you, Cristina. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, all the all those in charge of the projects and organizations that have made this event uh, uh, possible in my uh, intervention i would like to stress some points regarding the concept underlying this book uh, italian populism and constitutional law it's a book on italy that aims to address an international readership so uh, the point is, uh, in what respect does the Italian case deserve attention for comparative purposes? In this respect, again, I notice <coughs> some similarities with the approach followed by uh, Matei Aubel and uh, Yernei Letnar-Cernic in the book. Uh, as Cristina has said, there is some complementarity between our two books. So Italy, uh, we have considered Italy as a prime example of post-World War II constitutionalism, 
thereby meaning uh, a kind of constitutionalism marked by a will to break with an authoritarian past, a kind of constitutionalism in which uh, value-laden contents are crucial in defining uh, the, the characteristics, uh, the inspiration of uh, a constitutional order. So Italy is an example of post-World War II constitutionalism, and it also has some uh, distinctive characters uh, of its own that makes uh, a reflection on, uh, on, uh, on our country quite, uh, quite important, quite fruitful. Uh, first of all, a peculiar understanding of democracy uh, in the uh, constitutional order of the Italian Republic, uh, uh, representative democracy coexists with some elements of uh, direct democracy and uh, as uh, I will say later and Giuseppe will also say probably this is quite important uh, for a, a proper understanding of our constitutional order. Second point, Italy is a founding member of the European Union and the membership of the European Union looms large in the chapters of this book in order to understand the implications and the, um, the stakes underlying the, the, the populist challenge to constitutional democracy, it's crucial to consider, to, 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 to have in mind that Italy has been for 60 years, for more than 60 years, a member of the European communities and later of the European Union. And this contributes to shaping its constitutional order and in order to understand the impact of the populist challenge on its own constitutional order, the European dimension is, of course, a crucial one. Third point, Italy is a country with a long tradition of uh, populist and populist-like politics. Uh, there is a long-standing, well-established anti-parliamentarian tradition. Uh, in the founding years of the Republic, uh, um, some populist movements uh, actively engaged in uh, challenging the apparent monopoly of uh, the mass parties. A uh, famous example is the Uomo Qualunque, the Everyman Front. And, most of all, over the course of the political transition that has followed the end of the Cold War since 1989-1990, uh, many aspects of uh, Bernard Manin's audience democracy that are, that are shared by almost all contemporary constitutional democracies in the West have characterized the Italian political scene to the highest degree with the, the emergence of uh, a wide set of, uh, of self-styled or non-self-styled populist movement, the unstoppable, apparently unstoppable success of populist arguments in the public debate, in the public arena, and this was perhaps uh, the uh, highest point so far in this path, the uh, launch of uh, an entirely self-styled populist government in spring 2018, the so-called yellow-green government made up of a coalition between the League and the Five Star Movement. So Italy is a, a typical constitutional democracy in Western Europe, but it also has some distinctive traits that made it uh, a very promising topic, uh, but also for uh, successes or for uh, other comparative uh, analysis. And so it's a book on Italy, and it's a book in which we have uh, uh, talked about uh, the impact of populism from the unusual, the relatively unusual uh, perspective of constitutional law. Of course, in this field of research, a primary role in uh, uh, shaping concepts uh, in uh, in uh, uh, promoting, uh, uh, in defining research lines has been played by political scientists and political theorists and political sociologists, uh, Yves Meny, Yves Surel, Nadia Urbinati. And it should come as no surprise that uh, uh, Paul Blocker has uh, written the first chapter of this, uh, of this book. We have uh, focused on the way the populist discourse shapes or 
impacts upon the toolkit of constitutional law. And in so doing, we have addressed some seminal questions concerning the relationship between constitutionalism and uh, uh, populism. And in order to grasp the overall impact of uh, populist actors and claims on the Italian constitutional order, we have developed an all around comprehensive analysis. We have focused both on classical concepts of constitutional law, constitutional amendment, lawmaking procedures, non-legislative parliamentary procedures, referendums, and on policy debates, including the most topical ones. So the book has a, a, a structure uh, in which uh, uh, there is a there are some strong methodological commitments on which uh, uh, Giuseppe will uh, make some points uh, later. And starting from these methodological commitments, it develops an overarching, a, a, a comprehensive analysis of the impact of uh, populist sectors on the Italian legal order. In so doing, uh, we ha uh, have relied not only on constitutional law scholarship, but on other strands of public law scholarship because of the multifaceted uh, dimensions uh, that uh, the populist uh, challenge uh, reveals so criminal law law and religion new technologies and so on so thank you for your attention and i'm willing to looking forward to the debate thank you Thank you so much, Giacomo, for, uh, for your clear presentation, for guiding us uh, through, through this book. And uh, I pass the floor now to uh, Jerni Letnar Czernic, who is Associate Professor of Human Rights and Constitutional Law at New University in Slovenia. So Jerni, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Christina, dear friends, dear, dear colleagues. It's an honor to be in this uh, panel uh, however, I would uh, I have to admit that uh, I would rather see you in person and also rather go for a dinner after the the webinar. But uh, nonetheless, I hope uh, we can uh, do this uh, maybe in the autumn of uh, of this year. Well, uh, my my presentation or my input uh, into this discussion will be also on the book which we just published uh, together with. Uh, Matteo Alban and Goras Justinek on the impact of European institutions on the rule of law and democracy in uh, in Central Europe, but more specifically uh, on, on Slovenia. Uh, and this uh, this book uh, grew from uh, personal experience. Uh, well, we both uh, were born in Slovenia, and I spent most of my uh, childhood uh, in the communist Yugoslavia and communist Slovenia, no? uh, and only. A, only later, Slovenia became independent, in, and in 1990, it held uh, first democratic elections, uh, and then it got independent in June 1991. And at that time, uh, of course, we were too young to follow closely constitutional developments, but later, uh, when I started uh, law school in the, the second half of the 90s, uh, we were observing how the, how the first uh, mandate of the Slovenian Constitutional Court uh, introduced the normative standards of constitutional democracy, rule of law, human rights protection, uh, human dignity, and pluralism into, into Slovenian society. And here I have to emphasize that uh, these concepts were very foreign to the Slovenian uh, environment. And in a way, they are still, still, still are. And the book uh, tells the story about the failure of translation of normative standards of rural law and constitutional democracy into, uh, into, into practice. Uh, one has to know that Slovenia emerged as an independent democratic state from a, from a particular authoritarian, I prefer to use the, the adjective totalitarian regime, one party political system, system which violated human rights where uh, judges judges received phone calls from politicians how to decide particular cases there was no separation of uh, uh, powers in, uh, in in the government so it was a it was a totalitarian state so of course as any other state in central and eastern europe who was coming 
out of uh, Iron Curtain to constitutional democracy, Slovenia faced uh, many challenges how to um, internalize the standards of human dignity, pluralism, uh, rural law. And this book uh, accounts uh, for these uh, hurdles in the translation of these standards in different fields of uh, Slovenian society, different uh, fields of Slovenian constitutional democracy. The book itself is an example for legal research. Nonetheless, uh, we try to also apply some methods from a sociology of law. And our colleague, Ora Sustinek, also wrote a chapter on the, on the economy uh, of Slovenia, transition from a state plan to the market, market uh, economy. But nonetheless, it's a, in major part, is an example of, uh, of uh, normative uh, research. And I thought that would be maybe useful to give you three examples to see how those um, normative standards were um, poorly translated uh, into, into practice of Slovenian institutions, uh, into practice of Slovenian judiciary, legislative branch, and uh, executive branch. And um, those of you who will read this book, you will see that uh, we are very very critical about the reality of uh, Slovenian constitutional democracy. Now we use in the book a lot of language uh, in the phrases such as uh, dirty togetherness, corruption, presence of uh, nepotism, uh, substitution of rule of law by rule by law, uh, those, those practices which are so often uh, seen, um, seen across uh, Central and uh, Eastern uh, Europe. And uh, we thought that this book will fill uh, the gap in the research which has been published in the last 10 to 20 years on uh, comparative constitutional law. As already Matei said, uh, most of the authors uh, concentrate on the recent uh, uh, examples of very, uh, very direct attempts to overthrow constitutional democracy in in Hungary and, uh, and Poland, but most of the Central and Eastern European countries are example of overt attacks, clandestine, secret attempts, attempts uh, to uh, to overthrow constitutional democracy uh, in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, or even to to use a harsher term, to capture the state within uh, constitutional uh, democracy. And uh, the book tells the story of, uh, of, of Slovenia. There are many other examples from Romania, Bulgaria to the uh, former republics of the, of, the, uh, Slovenia, uh, of the Soviet Union. But let me now give you uh, three examples to see how uh, these uh, normative standards were not translated in practice in daily life of Slovenian constitutional democracy. Well, the first example would be the, the, the issue of uh, human rights protection. Slovenia, after 1991, adopted very modern formal normative standards of human rights protection. It is a state party almost to every UN human rights treaty. It is a party to the European Human Rights Convention since 90, uh, 1994. So the formal standards are very, very strong and, and, and solid. But nonetheless, uh, the human rights situation in Slovenia, it's often judged uh, by ideology. So, for example, state institutions uh, such as uh, Office of Ombudsman or any other government agency would only focus on certain issues of human rights protection. So, uh, for example, uh, rights of uh, Roma, rights of uh, so-called erased persons from the former republics of Yugoslavia, rights of migrants, asylum seekers, uh, asylum seekers. But then in the, same, in the same breath, they turn a blind eye to uh, also very important issues of human rights protection, such as uh, protections of civil and political rights. No? Most importantly, right to fair trial before the Slovenian uh, courts and also right to life. Uh, you may know that uh, after the second war in Slovenia, several uh, tens of thousands of people were summarily executed. Uh, and no one was held responsible for that. For that, uh, uh, not only that, uh, no one, uh, no one was prosecuted. And also, the state uh, is very reluctant uh, even to dig out 
the graves and put the name of the victims no? on the on the graves uh, where they were uh, summarily uh, executed. So, uh, very uh, piecemeal, partial uh, approach, which is uh, very much connected to the ideology of uh, of a person, political party uh, in power um, uh, at the moment in, uh, uh, in Slovenia. Then the uh, sec second second would be the the media landscape. Uh, Slovenia is example of is very textbook example of uh, of uh, post communist. Uh, state where um, where companies and individuals let's call them tycoons from other industry sectors such as construction or, or agri agriculture they invested heavily into into media they bought um, they bought uh, newspapers uh, televisions uh, tabloids in order to influence the 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 making of uh, media reality in Slovenia and in this way they also uh, distorted the, the Slovenian constitutional democracy. Of course the large part of Slovenian media landscape is uh, also uh, also controlled by the by the public sector, the public TV, uh, which is uh, unfortunately still under the influence of the daily politics which uh, has a direct influence on the uh, election of the director of the Slovenian television uh, uh, and uh, and radio, and often the Slovenian public uh, TV receives complaints as as being partial, as uh, as uh, uh, representing only one part of uh, 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 society. And uh, just uh, uh, briefly, the the third example would be as to the influence of the European Court of Human Rights in Slovenia. Well, here the the influence was also only only piece, uh, piecemeal. The the uh, exact uh, normative influence was only felt in the so-called pilot pilot judgments. So, all in all, to conclude, our our book aims to contribute to the debate on the on the constitutional backsliding uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. But it takes a, a different turn from a prevailing literature, arguing that. Uh, Constitutional backsliding is also occurring in a more clandestine, uh, uh, overt way. Thank you, Christina. Sorry for being a bit uh, over the time. No, 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 not at all. And thanks, Yerni, for providing us with these insights and examples, concrete examples of these uh, clandestine or uh, covert uh, constitutional backsliding. Uh, now I pass the floor to uh, Giuseppe Martinico, uh, who is a Associate Professor of Comparative uh, Public Law at Saltanna. Uh, Giuseppe, you have the floor. Uh, thanks indeed, uh, Cristina. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be part of, the, of the, this panel. I'm going to spend my, uh, my minutes to say uh, two or, or three things about um, our book in order to emphasize its uh, comparative flavor, uh, building upon what uh, uh, Giacomo already uh, said. O of course, th this is a book uh, about the, the Italian case, uh, but uh, we try to avoid the, 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 the we will say, a, a mere uh, parochial uh, level of analysis. Indeed, we uh, treated the Italy as an as a case study, as an example of uh, uh, post totalitarian constitutionalism. Our premise is that constitutionalism is uh, counter majoritarian in nature, and in this sense, uh, this aspect has been enriched uh, by a series of techniques, uh, doctrines, uh, devices uh, added after uh, uh, the Second uh, World War. I'm referring to the expansion of the judicial review of the legislation, the emergence of, uh, of eternity clauses, uh, and uh, of course the uh, necessity of super majority to pass constitutional amendments. Uh, we do have all this stuff in our constitution, so Italy is a, a, a perfect lab uh, to explore the uh, tricky relationship between 
uh, constitutionalism and populism. What do they share? Well, both uh, constitutionalism and populism are based on a uh, profound, I would say, distrust towards uh, a political power, uh, what Danilo Zolo called potestative pessimism. And uh, uh, both populism and constitutionalism uh, use similar concepts. However, this is our premise. Uh, um, uh, Further uh, 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 analogies uh, uh, cannot be found. I mean, uh, in, in the sense that uh, uh, we uh, we uh, try to uh, make a distinction be between these uh, these two phenomena, and we are interested in studying uh, how populists, especially when they are in office, uh, borrow, use, and uh, manipulate categories of constitutional theory and the instruments of constitutional law. Um, in so doing, uh, populist advance, this is that's how our point, the sort of constitutional counter-narrative. And um, in order to explore this counter-narrative, we we'll try to study how populists approach uh, constitutions. And in the uh, introduction, we identified two uh, strategies. Uh, mimetism and parasitism. Parasitism is a concept uh, which has already been uh, studied uh, in studies on populism. I'm referring to Arditi, Urbinati, uh, Fournier, among lawyers. Uh, by that, we uh, refer to the attempt made by populists at altering, at changing, even in a radical manner, uh, the, uh, we'll say, axiological uh, premises of a constitutional democracy. How? First of all, by reducing democracy to the mere rule of majority and uh, presenting the democracy as a sort of a trump card which should prevail always over uh, the other pillars of the constitutional constellation the rule of law and the protection of minorities but what about mimetism and uh, mim mimetism here refers to the way in which populist leaders uh, try to present themselves as a and their claims as a compatible and consistent with the language of constitutionalism. And in order to explain this point, I'm going to uh, quote a short passage taken from an official speech given by Giuseppe Conte at the United Nations in 2018. Um, that speech occurred during the, the first Conte government. Uh, we do believe uh, that, that there is a strong continuity be between the first and the second uh, Conte governments, and I'm happy to, uh, to I mean, say uh, uh, something more on on this in, in the debate. If you're interested in that, I'm quoting uh, Giuseppe Conte. He said, "When some accuse us of sovereignism or populism, I always enjoy pointing out that Article One of the Italian Constitution cites sovereignty and the people." Right. Here, uh, one can see the attempt made by populists at finding a reading consistent with uh, the text of the Italian constitution by stretching at the same time uh, some of its key concepts and, most importantly, by exercising a sort of cherry-picking approach to the uh, to the, the uh, wording of the, the Constitution. Indeed, when referring to Article 1 of the Italian Constitution, populists tend to mention just a part of the relevant norm, uh, the part recognizing the principle of popular sovereignty in order to find a confirmation of their majoritarian approach uh, to the, the fundamental charter and in order to reinforce the false dichotomy between themselves, the people voted by the people, and the others uh, seen as the enemy of the people. In so doing, they tactically omit that the same Article 1 of the Italian Constitution immediately clarifies how popular sovereignty should be understood as limited by the Constitution 
itself. In fact, this is the actual wording of Article 1 of our Constitution. Sovereignty belongs to the people and is exercised by the people in the forms and within the limits uh, of the Constitution. This, uh, this way of proceeding is very telling of uh, uh, how populists uh, approach the, the, the Constitution. This is very telling of, of their uh, majoritarian approach. Uh, pop populists understand the Constitution as straight jackets and this is one of the uh, points in common between populism and the popular uh, and political constitutionalism. Again, uh, in my view, however, uh, 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 these analogies cannot be extended uh, further. And another important element is it is uh, given by the fact that they perceive the constitutions as sources of unreasonable constraints imposed on the exercise of popular sovereignty. In this way, populists tend to come up with the artificial uh, tension existing, uh, according to them, between uh, a constitutionalism and democracy. That's why, according to them, in order to be really democratic, post-totalitarian constitutions, so constitution provided with a tenancy clauses, should open up radically to the claims of, of a sort of permanent constituent power. According to this counter narrative, the constituent power becomes a, a vehicle of legal resentment as Paul Bloch uh, beautifully uh, uh, wrote. Uh, finally, uh, did they uh, tend to treat the constitutions, and, and, and again, Italy is a, a fantastic example of this, um, in a self-serving approach, I mean, uh, they tend to uh, read the constitution sometimes as a powerful and sovereign shield uh, to use in order to question and attack the legitimacy of the European Union, the European Union, which is frequently portrayed as, as a, the product of the coup d'etat, of a sort of coup, coup d'etat. Here again, they uh, present a false dichotomy, uh, the Italian constitution versus the EU treaties, ma manipulating actually the message behind the Italian constitution, which is characterized by uh, a, a strong uh, uh, a principle of uh, international openness. So these were the points that, that I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Giuseppe, for shedding light on the features and pillar of the uh, constitutional counter narrative of populist. And uh, uh, let me thank also the uh, other distinguished speakers in this first uh, uh, panel. We now move to another distinguished panel of speakers, this time discussants. And uh, uh, just let me um, tell you all uh, that uh, the floor will be open for Q&A after uh, the discussants have spoken. So feel free to uh, write your comments down in the chat. So the first discussant uh, uh, I introduce here is Paul Blocker, who is an associate professor at the Sociology and Economic of Law Department, University of Bologna. Uh, an expert of both uh, populism, uh, uh, constitutional backsliding in Italy and in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, let me just recall the uh, um, book that he recently uh, published with Manuel Anselmi on populism, uh, multiple populism, Italy's um, uh, democracy mirror, uh, which is linked uh, to our discussion today. So Paul, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I would like to thank the organizers very much for uh, um, having me here in this particular role, which is not an easy role, um, because um, in, in one way I feel a bit in a conflict of interest, in the sense that there's a chapter of mine <laughs> in one of the books, which I'm supposedly uh, going to critically discuss, and I will try to. Um, but I'm also, on the other hand, in a, in a difficult position because I think these are both very important books. Uh, they're very necessary books. Um, and uh, one of the things that strikes me is that they both have a comparative um, program, which I think could be fleshed out even uh, much more. And that might be uh, uh, two uh, uh, potential points for both books. Um, um, I, I will try to be uh, more or less uh, structured, but it won't be easy because I'm going to pick up also on a couple of things that have been said 
uh, in, in the very interesting uh, presentations. One aspect is, uh, as uh, Giuseppe uh, touched upon also at the very end of his, his intervention, is, is the role of the European Union. Um, and there, one of the aspects I, I particularly appreciate in the introduction to the book of Matei uh, Eierne uh, is a rather critical uh, position with regard to the European Union, um, and particularly in terms of the, uh, the Central and Eastern European and the Southeastern European context, um, a claim they make, and I tend to uh, back that claim up, is that there has been too little understanding. Uh, of the social, political, economic realities of these countries. Um, and so that is something I would like to uh, uh, right now already uh, ask uh, both Matei and Yerne to, to comment on further. Uh, how should we take this argument further? What does this also mean in, in terms of a research agenda? Um, and then the point made on, um, and that's a second uh, uh, dimension I would like to uh, refer to, the point made on overt and covert backsliding. I think on the one hand, this is an interesting distinction. Uh, but on the other, um, I wonder to what extent we cannot see both processes occurring uh, in, in, in one and the same society. I mean, perhaps, and maybe that's the way I try to read the Polish reality, Perhaps uh, one could read the current much more overt project of the Law and Justice Party um, undermining liberal democracy and constitutional democracy as a uh, latest addition to a more long-term covert uh, uh, project, or perhaps not even project, but simply uh, situation. Um, and that brings me to a point that I think um, all the speakers might want to reflect upon more which I think is really essential. And now finally, some research around these issues is coming to the fore, and that is um, civil society, social forces, uh, but also more in general sense, perhaps, perhaps even in a kind of uh, uh, Mortatian sense, uh, the material dimension to constitutions. Um, and that indeed uh, uh, links, I think, um, uh, the debates uh, in both books uh, in, in two important extents, but perhaps uh, both books have not yet uh, fleshed that dimension out sufficiently. Um, that is, um, and that brings me indeed to the Italian case, how should we then, if we present the Italian case, and which by the way also in that book that was briefly mentioned, which I co-edited with uh, Manuel Anselmi, is a claim we make, the Italian case as a case study, as a comparative case, not as, a, an, as an isolated case. So how are we going to uh, think uh, about that case? And how does it make us, um, uh, help us exploring other cases as well? And I think uh, one of the remarks that uh, Giuseppe made at the end on um, 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 anti or post-totalitarian constitutionalism might be an important link and that equally links up again then with uh, the notion of material constitution and with the notion of the social and political forces that actually back up a particular constitutional system. And so there, the Italian case, I think, is extremely important uh, because at least in my reading, um, the 1948 constitutional compromise um, that underpins probably even today still uh, a lot of the existing constitutional democratic order, that particular compromise has become pretty dramatically challenged from the early 1990s onwards. So, so much so that some like uh, Valerio Nida speak of a kind of season of constitutional reform, which is not merely about technical uh, issues, um, mostly uh, often claimed pertain to the second part of the Italian constitution, but it's clearly a rupture in Italian history in terms of how to relate to the 1948 constitution. Um, and so that would be one uh, dimension, I think, um, where the Italian case uh, could be explored even further, um, and which could also be linked then, and this is more um, uh, hypothetical in a way, and that is also a point of critique I would have on the, uh, the book uh, on uh, Italian constitutionalism and populism, um, is that there's no concluding chapter. Um, 
and that might be actually pretty much needed. How do we, how do we perceive the future of Italian uh, constitutional democracy uh, in a broader light? And that is another dimension I think we should remind ourselves of continuously um, in a broader light of uh, in which um, uh, populism and its approach towards the law, towards the rule of law, towards liberal constitutionalism is under attack, not mainly or only in Italy, or not merely in Hungary and Poland, uh, but in many, many parts uh, in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And that's something to think about as well. What does this mean for our model of uh, post or anti-totalitarian constitutionalism? I think this is a, a further uh, aspect to be explored um, in a comparative lens exactly, and in the historical lens. And that also brings me back again uh, uh, to uh, Matei and Yenne's book, um, where uh, some of the arguments they make is that um, the insights into what uh, has happened and what is happening uh, in Central and Eastern, Southeastern Europe are insufficiently appreciated uh, by European Union, but also by uh, generally by, by many, let's say, more Western scholars. Um, and so, uh, aspects of transitional justice uh, are underplayed, uh, are not sufficiently appreciated. And um, I would add to that also the whole moment of change from communism to post-communism, 1989 in parts of Central and Eastern Europe, 1991 for the former Yugoslavian states, that whole moment uh, is of crucial importance because it um, it is still a bone of contention. It's still part of a large debate of the, the finalité, of the end goals of that society that emerged uh, from the early 1990s onwards. And probably it's not by coincidence, more or less the same years as in Italy, the major post Second World War rupture emerged uh, around uh, Tangentopoli, etc. Et um, and so um, I would also like to. Uh, uh, Make it, I'm not sure how much time I still uh, have left, but um, I would also like to strongly emphasize not only the comparative dimension, but the great need um, for an historical uh, approach, um, particularly if you look at uh, uh, the um, um, Central Eastern and Southeastern European part, it seems to me that we need to very carefully reassess the past. Uh, I uh, just um, had an article in the Journal of uh, Mother European History, part of a special issue where exactly that it, it's that what that we try to do, to reassess what was socialist legality actually about? What actually did it mean? Uh, what role uh, did uh, dissidents play in promoting human rights, constitutionalism, but also what role did it play perhaps in reproducing uh, certain images of constitutionalism that are still with us today. Uh, and so how do we understand uh, continuities and discontinuities? Um, and, and, and that's another matter, I think, that is extremely important to realize in Central and Eastern, Southeastern Europe, is there's this very strange coincidence, and perhaps not so strange in reality, uh, of practices of populist nowadays. For instance, if you look at the way uh, Orban and Kaczynski deal with civil society, um, it closely uh, uh, dovetails with processes that happened uh, during communist times. So there is definitely um, a certain amount of continuity that we have perhaps under uh, appreciated in the past when um, EU enlargement, etc., has been praised as putting Central and Eastern and Southeastern Europe uh, onto the path towards liberal constitutional democracy. Um, and so uh, then uh, actually a, a final remark because I'm, I'm close to, uh, um, my time is almost up and there we are. Um, and so a final remark on this tension uh, that Giuseppe mentioned between constitutionalism and populism, uh, which is, uh, I think is very important. Um, but I think we need to appreciate uh, that populism plays into a myth of popular sovereignty. Uh, but I think it can equally be argued uh, that constitutionalism, the way we understand it in the post-war, post-totalitarian 
uh, uh, model in that guise, there's equally an attachment to a kind of apolitical neutral myth of order, of fabrication, I would like to call it, of a legalistic democracy, which, however, and that's one part of the popular story, I think, is now increasingly openly, in an overt sense, being heavily contested as problematic. And there are problematic dimensions to that model, in my view. And so I believe we need to critically discuss them rather than simply praise rule of law, liberal constitutionalism, etc. Um, but I stop there, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul, for these important comments and, and reflections. Um, and I now pass the floor to uh, Roberto Castaldi, who is Associate Professor of Political Philosophy. Um, he uh, cooperates with Santana School of Advanced Studies and is the director of CESU, this uh, study center, uh, providing also training, uh, communication in matters of UN global governance, and one of the leading forces behind uh, Euractive Italy, if I'm not wrong. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I give you the floor, Roberto. Thanks. Thank you, Cristina, and thanks to all the organizers. It's a great pleasure uh, not just to participate uh, in, in this webinar, but also for uh, CESU and for Euractive Italy to contribute to this uh, uh, event uh, within our uh, We European project, Jean Monnet project. Uh, we, it's a project by which we are trying to highlight the importance of the European Union for uh, citizens uh, all over Italy and, uh, uh, of course, for uh, in, in the other European countries. And I think the discussion we are having today is very much uh, linked to this. So I, I would like to make just a few comments on the two books from uh, a political theory perspective. And the first issue is uh, uh, about uh, the overall project of uh, uh, undermining uh, uh, constitutionalism, which is the project of illiberal democracy. And illiberal democracy is not uh, a democracy at all. But the fact uh, that those who aim at uh, a new form of authoritarian rule still need to represent their view as a democratic view suggests that democracy still uh, has uh, a very strong legitimizing power for public opinion, which means that even those who want really to undermine uh, democracy as we know it, as liberal democracy, still have to uh, use uh, those words. And this is why uh, it's so crucial what Giuseppe was talking about, the disguise of populism exploiting, trying to exploit some elements of constitutionalism. And regarding this aspect, I would like to point out uh, uh, one of the crucial issues which has uh, emerged in all these attempts, which is the undermining of the independence of the judiciary, uh, which is apparently a legal issue, a constitutional issue and uh, a technical one. But eventually we have found out, especially when we look at the situation in Hungary and Poland, but not just in these countries, as a... Uh, 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 the, the other book by Matene show, and Yerne shows uh, is uh, uh, that there are a number of other issues at stake, which are political, institutional, uh, and cultural. Political, the intertwin, the interlinkage, the interaction between national and European politics is crucial. The fact that the Fidesz party was uh, a member of the European People's Party has been a crucial element in the delay by the European Union uh, in tackling what was happening in uh, Hungary and in uh, somehow uh, um, uh, not realizing the relevance, the importance uh, and what was at stake there from the beginning. The second element is institutional, and as Matei pointed out, the fact that unanimity rule is uh, uh, dominates the, the procedure, uh, the decision-making procedure at the European level regarding the defense of the rule of law means that it makes it extremely difficult to be used, especially if there are more than a country in which uh, uh, we have uh, these uh, tendencies, because one can uh, put a veto in favor of the others, providing a fantastic coverage for what is happening in both countries. 
And the third aspect that was also pointed out uh, very effectively in uh, uh, Mattei and Yerni book uh, is about uh, the problem of the legitimacy of the European Union in intervening uh, to protect the rule of law in single member states. And this is due to the fact that the European Union is uh, an autonomous legal order, as the European Court of Justice uh, has pointed out, but is still not based on a clear constitutional pact. If you want, uh, it's not a federation. Maybe it's not yet a federation. We don't know when, uh, where the process will uh, uh, will end. But this is an issue that makes it more difficult in uh, uh, political terms for the EU to intervene. And therefore, the only action that have been taken were taken by the European Court of Justice, which is a federal institution. Uh, just like on the economic side, we usually see that it's the European Central Bank, which is also a federal institution, the one which is the quickest and the most effective in answering big crises, like in 2011 with the sovereign debt crisis or with the pandemic uh, now where the ECB was the first to act with a massive uh, action of over a trillion euro to uh, make it possible for different member states to make new debt to uh, deal with the pandemic. So this is the first uh, uh, the first point related to the uh, issue of uh, liberal democracy and the role of the EU in uh, handling this kind of project. The second uh, issue is about Italy and populism, and so we'll move to uh, the the uh, the book by Giacomo Giuseppe. And so on. this is. Uh, a crucial issue. I, I think that you are, uh, are right, as you point out in the book, that Italy is a, a very important case study for, uh, for populism. And, uh, but Italians usually don't think so. When uh, we speak about the undermining of rule of law, people think about Hungary and Poland and don't think that things can happen in Italy or are happening in Italy. And the fact that, for instance, Matteo Salvini has uh, explicitly said that he thinks that Hungary and Poland are the best rule countries in the whole EU, or that he feels more confident and more at home in uh, Putin's Russia than in any uh, European countries, uh, should be a very worrisome uh, element regarding the uh, risk that uh, Italy is uh, facing with regards to constitutional backsliding and the erosion of the rule of law. And from this point of view, I'd like to make a, a, a criticism of uh, uh, the title uh, of uh, Giacomo delle Donne chapter about the yellow-green government. Because the green in English and in Europe uh, are the green, while the league is clearly black. Uh, the league at the European level is allied with Le Pen and with all the most extreme far-right group. And uh, this is uh, uh, clearly uh, identified uh, in the European level as the extreme right. Uh, so it's the black, not, not the green. It's true that in Italy, uh, we used to associate uh, the color green uh, to the Northern League, but this league is very different from, the, from, from, from that one on the one end, and at the European level, and in English, the green, uh, uh, is usually associated with, with the uh, environmentalist uh, uh, organization. But this is also an element which is relevant for the Italian debate, because until we don't realize where is uh, the league position today, which means with the black, with the extreme right, with uh, Joe Big, with Le Pen and so on, uh, Golden Dawn uh, uh, and so on, it is more difficult for Italians to understand uh, the real uh, potential impact of this party on Italian politics, uh, rule of law and political system. And of course, uh, this element is uh, uh, made uh, uh, more risky in Italy because it's a country that has uh, a very weak public ethic, has basically no memory, and the public debate and the political competition is based on the lack of memory. So it is possible for people that have been in government for 20 years uh, to campaign uh, promising uh, uh, the moon, like if they were not uh, in office until the day before, and so on and so forth. 
And clearly, this is a, a, a context uh, in which makes uh, uh, the populist narrative and the populist uh, uh, um, claims uh, uh, an a more effective vehicle. Because there is not a, a rational public debate uh, asking, uh, uh, putting to the test uh, uh, the promises with what people have really done uh, when they were uh, in power. And this has been emphasized very well in several of, of the chapters of the book. Um, and the third issue I would like to raise is about uh, uh, Europe, uh, in the sense that Europe uh, is becoming the new dominant political cleavage in most uh, uh, national competition too. But it's also becoming a dividing line among populists themselves. And we have different uh, kind of populism at European level. If we think about Spain, for example, we have... Uh, uh, Podemos and Ciudadanos that have been considered uh, example of a new populist uh, uh, movement, and they are both strongly pro-European. While in Italy, we had two different uh, uh, populism, the League and the Five Star Movement, and they were both uh, uh, anti-European with the Five Star Movement on a more ambiguous note, which was uh, essential for them to be able to make an alliance either with the League or with the Democratic Party after the election. So they made a nationalist turn to go with the League in the first part of the legislature. And when the, uh, their government collapsed, they made a pro-European turn to make the alliance with the Democratic Party. But uh, uh, essentially now, this is the main line of division between the Five Star Movement and the League. So the two populist parties in Italy are divided mainly by their position on, uh, on Europe. And I think this is an essential element because uh, uh, I believe that the future of democracy is strictly linked to the future of the European Union. Liberal democracy cannot survive at national level alone because uh, uh, sovereignty in the 21st century can only be effectively exercised at European level. We are facing such huge challenges that they cannot be handled at national level. They can only be handled at European and some of them only at the global level, in fact, when we speak about climate change and this kind of global problems. So when we have the, we have this narrative of nationalism, of uh, popular sovereignty applied at national level, which basically reflect a 19th century vision of sovereignty in a 21st century world in which this uh, sovereignty cannot be effective. At the same time, we are seeing uh, a new narrative about European sovereignty coming out, uh, and the first to do that was Macron in France, and he was uh, astonished to have uh, a French president uh, using the word sovereignty applied to the EU and not to France uh, itself. Uh, and so there is going, the, the, we are seeing a new framing of uh, the narrative related to sovereignty. So one based on national sovereignty, on 19th century, if you want, national sovereignty. And on the other one, the attempt to create a new narrative of a European sovereignty more uh, linked to the 21st century realities. And I think we, my closing remark would be about what we are living today. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that uh, uh, no member state can do it alone. No member state has the power and the resources to deal with such a huge problem and its economic impact alone. And we are seeing that there is a request by European citizens, civil society, academics, and so on, economic actors for a European answer, which has provoked a proposal by the Commission, the Next Generation Europe Plan, which is uh, nobody would have thought six months ago that something like that could have even been discussed at European level. So I think that what we are seeing is a great reshuffling that can also impact significantly on the new narrative of sovereignty, which will impact also on the populist discourse. And if we arrive to a reform of the European Union, this will also provide the new legitimacy to intervene more strongly in defense of rural law and at the national level as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Roberto, also for these important remarks from the European perspective um, and uh, on current developments. 
And now we uh, um, give the floor, I can give the floor to um, Armen Mazmanian, um, who is a, a senior research fellow at the American University of Armenia, is an expert, uh, uh, amongst other things, of post-Soviet politics and constitutional law. He has collaborated with a variety of European universities. Uh, he is the director of the Pella Institute for Policy Dialogue and the Center for Studies in Yerevan. So, uh, Armen, you have the floor. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you, colleagues, for very insightful presentations and reports. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this brilliant panel and congratulations also to the authors and the co-authors of the two books which definitely enrich our knowledge about uh, the two countries but also the global developments with populism, democracy, constitutional democracy being of course probably the main concern of all of us. Now I want to reflect on these two books or the, de the debate of today actually trying to not simply concentrate on the case studies of these books, which I said were brilliant indeed, but trying to bring this debate more to the global level and the comparative level. And also since I'm the last to present in this panel, probably to also stimulate a debate on um, what comes next and uh, where is the world, where is the global community going with this uh, experience having already spread all over the world. And uh, in this exercise, I will really want to uh, rely on and uh, bring Umberto Eco, maybe surprisingly, but to support and illustrate some of the points I want to emphasize here. And I want to rely on his uh, very famous essay on fascism, the eternal fascism, or fascism, which I'm sure you all know, but revisiting it would probably spread additional light on the things we are discussing. Of course, doing that, I do not want to draw any parallels between Italy in the times of Mussolini and Italy now. It's exactly not my intention, but I first, again, want to make the perspectives of today's discussion more global, more comparative in a sense, but as also Paul suggested, more historical in their essence. And I also want to, having this experience, maybe a bit extreme experience, a bit exaggerated experience of fascism, to understand where does this populist uh, tendency goes. Maybe my position would be a bit pessimistic, but I mean, having that extreme perspective may help uh, arrive at the end of the panel to the more balanced approach. Now, I want to concentrate on several of Echo's, uh, Echo's uh, features which, by which he distinguishes fascism, and I want to suggest that they are exactly coincided with what, how we could describe today's populist regimes. Let us look at a few of them, for example. He says that one of a very typical feature of fascism was irrationalism, and if we look at some of the most populist regimes of today in the world. And if we just ironically look at, for example, some of the responses to COVID, for example, we could really see how irrational are these uh, populist regimes. More anecdotically, maybe, the leader of Belarus, which we know as the consolidated authoritarian country, but Maybe only those who are following this country very closely know that it's also a very typical populist country, populist leadership at least. So suggesting to fight COVID by shots of vodka, anecdotal and yet very uh, representative of populism. On a more serious level, let's look at how um, world leaders, more global leaders are responding to uh, climate change how Trump or Bolsonaro respond to climate change, representing denial, anti-intellectualism, -in anything that is connected with critical attitude, denialism of everything is a very representative of both, as Echo would say, to fascism, but also to populism. Fear of difference, obviously, 
very much reflected in how these populist regimes that we all know today are responding to migration crisis, Orban, for example, or the Italian populists. Uh, the appeal to a frustrated middle class, machismo, I don't want to go into details of this for the lack of time, but it's very representative again. Obsession with the plot, and especially with a uh, hypothetical international plot. Orban, I, I, I used to live in Hungary last year, being part of the Central European University program there. And I, I was amazed to see, even uh, at the level of uh, public advertisement, this visual advertisement depicting Soros, then the head of the EU presidency, Juncker, in a uh, uh, way to kind of represent an international plot against Hungary, Soros on one hand, and the EU plotting uh, conspiracy against Hungary. This is very representative. But what about Trump? Trump speaking of a plot of China with the World Health Organization. Ridiculous, isn't it? Of these features of fascism that uh, Echo depicts and which clearly uh, go into the characteristics of populist regimes, for me at least, I'm very much admiring and um, trying to concentrate, on especially the one in which Echo says that fascism is really distinguished or was really distinguished with the lack of ideology. We are seeing a lack of ideology throughout the world in all the regimes which we try or we do, we do identify with populism. And indeed, if we even try to at least associate any of the famous populist regimes with any ideology, it's rather anti-ideology. I mean, I, I'm failing to identify Trump with uh, republicanism. And definitely I'm not identifying Putin, for example, with any ideology. It is exactly anti-ideology. Putin is anti-liberal. He is neither liberal nor anything. He is not conservative, he is not Republican. He is anti-liberal. And this is how the entire state ideology, ideology in brackets here, is built. And that's why I would, in any other context, argue that um, Russia probably at the moment doesn't have an ambition to be a superpower, or at least a first-class superpower, because it doesn't have a first-class ideology. Uh, however, our attitude is towards uh, uh, communism. Communism was, in a way, a very attractive uh, normative concept. And it made Russia or the Soviet Union a first class superpower. But this lack of uh, modern identity in Russia currently, it makes it obviously not a first class superpower, but a superpower in a way responding to a first class superpower. I probably distracted you from the main discussion, but I think these are important considerations. And I'm com coming to the core of my response, in which I also want to identify some. Uh, more direct responses to the chapters which we are discussing today. This uh, component of lack of ideology in modern popular regimes makes us think about uh, exactly what kind of populisms are we talking about. And let me remind you that even the title of this uh, uh, panel speaks about populisms, not populism. And I suggest that uh, the authors and also the speakers and everyone, actually, we should distinguish between the types of populism based on what I suggested here, and at least distinguish between post-authoritarian post populism. I agree that probably this is in the minority of cases today, but yet looking at Ukraine, for example, very much populist regime, but uh, populist that is a response to Authoritarian or more, more uh, corrupt practice. The same is true about Moldova, Armenia. I would think maybe there are some elements of this about also in Italy, which and and Brazil, which also emerge from not maybe authoritarian but very much corrupt practice of the past. So post-authoritarian populism versus neo-authoritarian populism. So here, I think the distinction is important to make. And on the same at the same time, and these are probably equal, 
considerations to distinguish between utopian or naive populism and abusive authoritarian populism. And of course, looking at the main paradigmatic cases of uh, authoritarian populism today, we have to understand them more in also, also in light of this distinction and understand what kind of uh, instrument they are using or abusing, in, including and very much so, very much so the constitutional instruments. And this was perfectly and very illustratively dem demonstrated in the chapter in the book on uh, Italian populism, where the populists are uh, abusing actually constitutional amendment, the referenda, the courts, the electoral systems in many cases, in Hungary, for example. So these are the constitutional institutions we are getting abused by authoritarian populists. And the idea is here is to manipulate the public, while the naive or post authoritarian populism is rather, uh, it's due to its naivete, romanticism in a way, emerging from uh, this uh, uh, their experiences of the past, they are appealing to the public rather than manipulating to the public. Maybe the line between the two is not uh, so clear in every situation, and maybe in some situations one can flow, for example, naive romantic populism may also flow to. Uh, authoritarian populism, but in some cases it may vanish. And now the second perspective, which I uh, concluding this uh, response want to um, present is just for every one of us to also think where does the world go or where the, where, where, where the populist regimes of today are going, also having in, in mind in the, also these distinctions. And as far as this naive Utopian populist regimes are concerned, I believe, especially in light of the COVID, in light of lack of uh, professionalism in which uh, these governments could respond to COVID, some of them may vanish or disintegrate or at least change their largely populist nature. But what about those abusive populists? And uh, again, here comes my at least imitation of pessimism. Is it that the regimes which are going in the direction in which uh, Umberto Eco would warn us when we said we must keep alert so that the sense of these words will not be forgotten again. Poor fascism is still around us. Poor fascism can come back under the most innocent of these guys. So is this about the modern populist regimes that we're facing today, about uh, Hungary, Poland, about Trump and Putin? Um, I think this current situation and the world is living right now very, very turbulent times, which will also be a test for these regimes too. One of the most illustrative or more immediate tests is coming in the coming days in Poland as they will be having the presidential elections in a, in a week or two. Maybe this is the lesser or the more, more local uh, example, but we will also see uh, in the fall with the elections in the US, whether Trump is uh, again able to um, mobilize on the differences, for example, on possibly, but hopefully not, on uh, racist divisions, or the anti racist mobilization is going to kill him, on the contrary. And finally, again, I'm joining the voices of the colleagues who presented before me and seeing where the dust with the COVID comes down, what will be the legitimacy of the EU, EU institutions and the EU leaders in responding to the crisis and whether the EU emerges as a strong or stronger institution or it is uh, delegitimized in a way. And this will play a very, very important role, not only for Europe, but also for uh, global politics and the world in general. This much, thank you. Thank you very much, Armen, for uh, these reflections also about perspective developments in the time of pandemic and post-pandemic, and also on drawing our attention on the variety of populism we should be aware of. So thanks uh, again also to the uh, discussants for their very insightful comments. 
And now uh, I want to see, uh, so we can open the floor for the Q&A and uh, I will try to collect and summarize a few questions that I see written down uh, um, amongst the live comments. There is already one by uh, Nedim uh, Ogic uh, um, to uh, Matei, but also to Yerni, uh, on uh, the relationship between uh, this constitutional decay and its impact on political competition uh, in Slovenia. Matej, if you, if you want. Sure, thank you very much for the question, Nedim. It's, um, I, I, I could go for a long time discussing this, but uh, as, as, we, as we stress in the book, it's not so much the, the political spectrum as such, the political space in Slovenia has it is it is the political space in Slovenia that is affecting the constitutional democracy and not the constitutional elements of the Slovenian constitutional democracy that might be hampering the uh, the political competition inside the political space. Uh, the problem is that we have witnessed, uh, especially over the last decade, a complete implosion of the political space meaning that the traditional political parties, even those that were able to be established in the 20 years of, the, of Slovenian independence, have basically disappeared. And that since uh, 2008, we have, we have seen constant rounds of the so-called political lists that do not describe, they do not want to describe themselves as political parties, but they call themselves any political lists that have prevailed, uh, that have prevailed in the uh, in the political battle, uh, in the elections, taken over the government, but then immediately collapsed after a few years, since they didn't have the kind of infrastructure that you need as a political party, and these political lists were then essentially dependent on the formal and informal structures uh, of the Slovenian state, influential factional groups. Uh, through the, and, and where those influential, influential factional groups were governing through this apolitical list the, uh, the political situation in Slovenia. Um, so this would be my quick response uh, to, your, uh, to your question. But I dedicate a whole chapter to the so-called vicious circle of uh, democracy in, in Slovenia. And then I invite you to, to have a look at it if you're interested. Thanks, Matej. And let's see if uh, Jerni has some something to add, some other remarks. Sure, I can uh, add a brief response. Uh, I agree with Matej. Uh, I think that the main, the main uh, challenge you know, to consider democracy in Slovenia is not a formal structure, you know, but it's the political environment uh, as the institution of political space are uh, very weak. You know? They can change, you know, from one election to another. Uh, we had three or four examples of uh, political parties being established just uh, a month or a month and a half before parliamentary elections, and then that uh, those political party parties uh, won elections or they came second uh, on on third, meaning that uh, political parties, as also institutions of constitutional democracy, are understood as a is a means, you know, to 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 collect the prey of a Slovenian state, uh, both in financial human resources, but also more pragmatic pragmatic uh, way. So the, the the gist is that the the environment is extremely weak and is subject to attempts of a state capture of dirty togetherness and, uh, and corruption. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks to you as well. And I think now we, I don't see uh, other questions for the moment, maybe more will be added later. So uh, I would like to give the chance to the speakers to respond to the uh, comments of the discussants. And I will follow the reverse order, probably, in which they, they, they spoke. Um, so starting with uh, uh, Giuseppe um, uh, Martinico. Uh, maybe for five minutes each would be okay. okay. 
Okay, well, thanks indeed, first of all, for all these comments and questions. I think that there is a lot of stuff, I mean, for the discussion. I want to start by uh, gathering uh, a couple of points that uh, uh, both uh, Paul and Armin uh, made, uh, so about the importance of uh, uh, the comparative analysis, uh, carried out that have I been mean, both uh, at uh, historical and uh, synchronic, I would say, level. And indeed, the, 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 I mean, the, the Italian case is, is very interesting from this point of view. I do agree with Paul um, uh, when uh, he uh, emphasized that there, I mean, the importance of populism as a window of opportunity to rethink upon uh, some uh, uh, long standing issues that have I been. Mean, in the life of our constitutional polity. So uh, I, 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 I think that the rights and the, the indeed, uh, but I, um, but I think it is that uh, populism, especially this new wave of populism in Italy, uh, obliges, uh, we we'll say, I mean, constitutional lawyers and constitutional history, uh, constitutional uh, lawyers and constitutional theorists, sorry, uh, to uh, uh, deal with some uh, uh, long standing subject. That, I would say of uh, constitutional law. I, I tried to uh, make a list that, I mean, the first point is a, a, a new reflection over the uh, myth of uh, uh, the Italian resistance as a unitary moment. So this has a lot to do with the idea of uh, uh, the constituent power as something unitary, uh, which uh, shapes uh, the uh, fundamental compromise of sort of the constitutional legal system. Uh, there are important books, I mean, written by historians, such as I mean, Pavone and, and many others, uh, who have questioned actually this view, I mean, showing that uh, uh, the Italian resistance was a, a sort of civil war. And this uh, leads me to the second important point, the issue uh, concerning, concerning the neutrality of constitutions, uh, the issue of the ne neutrality of post-totalitarian constitutions or post-World War II constitutions. Th this is a burning issue. And this is a point which has been uh, employed by uh, many populist leaders. I mean, uh, not only uh, Salvini, but even Berlusconi and many others. It's in this sense, as Marco Tarchi uh, pointed out, that, that I mean, Italy has been uh, the, the, the lab, I mean, a sort of promised land, I mean, uh, uh, for those who are interested the, in the populisms. So this is also true. And the fact is, is that pro probably Italy, and this confirms the importance of uh, uh, historical uh, comparative desert, Italy didn't deal with its own past. And there are here the beautiful books by Battini, for instance, right? So, and this has created a kind of political and cultural environment which has favored the uh, uh, the emergence of uh, this new wave of uh, uh, right-wing populism. So I, I, I think that uh, uh, you are right. And the, the, when I quote here uh, a, 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 a line I mean, I mean, written by uh, Spadaro many years ago, he, he said the constitutions belong to all, but they are not empty. They are not politically neutral. I think that this point is powerful. Uh, they tend to include constitutionalism is different from populism as it tends to include the other. And the other is a competitor. It is not an, a, 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 an enemy. But at the same time, uh, and this is my final point, uh, the uh, the other topic that we are gonna for, for sure that we start in the future is the relationship between uh, direct and representative democracy. And I think that we can uh, find, I mean, something useful even in the proposals advanced by uh, some of these, I mean, populist movements. Um, final thing. The, the uh, lack of a concluding chapter that actually we uh, try to understand this book as a research agenda. Uh, that's why on, on purpose we didn't write a, a final chapter, but uh, I, I do agree. I mean, 
perhaps uh, it, it is a pity. So thank you very much. Thanks, Giuseppe. And uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, there is uh, um, a new question. Uh, maybe the other speakers can uh, take it into account by Adriano uh, Martufi, who um, is asking about uh, the uh, use of the uh, notion of constitutional democracy and liberal democracy as uh, uh, synonyms. Um, um, so what is, uh, uh, what is your uh, take on that, uh, as both books uh, um, emphasize a lot uh, uh, the notion of constitutional democracy? Um, there is a contrast with uh, um, uh, liberal democracy or so, uh, so, uh, social rechtsstaat. Uh, so for the other speakers, and the next one on the list is Yerni. Thank you very much uh, for the comments and, and questions. Uh, they really made me think uh, uh, the last uh, question, which was, or, or the challenge posed by, by Armen, you know, what does it mean for the future development uh, in a comparative context of uh, liberal and constitutional um, democracy? I think this is, is a super, uh, super topical question. No? Um, and also, if, if if I connect this question to the point made by by Paul, uh, uh, remarking that perhaps uh, the European Commission, European Union, do not uh, properly the, understand the context, the so social, economic, political uh, context of uh, many of the states of uh, Central and uh, uh, Eastern uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I would agree with uh, this point. We made uh, we addressed this point briefly in our in our uh, book, uh, arguing that there is our emphasis on the context of Poland uh, and, and Hungary, and that uh, the Commission turns a blind eye to Central Eastern European states, even though, as you know, it has uh, supervisory mechanisms over some um, judicial proceedings, both in Romania uh, and. Uh, and uh, and Bulgaria, but uh, I would give, I would say, given the my recent research uh, and I'm following the developments in um, in southeastern Europe, I would say that uh, the European Commission, but also the member states, do not take seriously the the decay of uh, constitutional democracy and rule of law, uh, if, particularly within the southern eastern Europe. If you talk if you talk about uh, this Balkan region. No, uh, the populist movements in uh, in Serbia, Macedonia, in some parts of Bosnia and Her Herzegovina, the you know the long-term process of uh, joining the, the the European Union and also the postponement uh, on the negotiations with uh, with Albania and some other some other states. Uh, I would say that the European Commission does not really take it seriously. What kind of effect such such decisions, such, such messages uh, convey to the governments, but also to the institutions in those uh, countries? You know, the effects could be very, very negative. Uh, the they could in turn, you know, move those countries more to to even further to to authoritarian, totalitarian. Examples which uh, we see outside you know, the European uh, continent. So I agree with uh, Armin, but also Paul, that uh, the world is in a in a difficult times, and uh, the the question of constitutional democracy uh, as being the model for for uh, development of many parts of the world is uh, is being questioned by uh, systematic and uh, general arbitrary practices. Uh, uh, across uh, across the world, and if I just briefly mention, uh, try to reply to the last question. Uh, well, constitutional democracy has been the model, no, for for uh, developing the the states coming from the, from totalitarian authoritarian regimes uh, to uh, democracy, uh, and I still think there is a there is a valid there is a point in that in uh, in uh, persisting with this uh, with this. Uh, Project, but nonetheless, 
as we also mentioned in the book, the constitutional democracy depends on all of us. No, it depends on people. Depends uh, how uh, how people will keep and protect their own integrity. You know, um, honesty and, and, and fairness. And uh, that is often difficult to uh, to achieve in environments which, uh, uh, culture-wise, are not very prone to this uh, to these practices. So <clears throat> we'll see in the next decades whether the concept the, the concept will be strengthened or or weakened. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's time for uh, Giacomo to to respond and to react to the comments. Thank you, Cristina. So, a um, couple of uh, remarks. Uh, um, Paul Blocker has uh, highlighted, uh, on the one hand, uh, the need for uh, comparative analysis that also considers the uh, diachronic, the historical dimension. And uh, uh, he has uh, argued that uh, a research agenda should, uh, should leave some room for uh, analyzing the role of social forces uh, for a material understanding of the, the constitution in Mortatis' sense. This is uh, uh, a very important point in my view. And uh, uh, it's a very important point here. I, I'm not speaking about uh, uh, the, 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 the topic of our book. I'm rather speaking of uh, liberal democracies in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. If you think uh, of uh, the joint operation of, uh, on the one hand, the weakness of civil society, the uh, lack of acceptance, the apparent failure of uh, constitutional transitions after the downfall of communism. In this respect, the most telling case is Hungary. So you, you have to focus on how a uh, transition to constitutional democracy after communism that was uh, uh, celebrated as a success uh, turned into a apparent, a perceived failure and you 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 understand the weakness of a social uh, the civil society the social dimension having in mind that uh, um it it mirrors in some respects uh, the lack of acceptance of the result of the constitutional transition after 1990 so th this is just an example but uh, it's an example that i'm using in order to to say that i agree with uh, uh, paul's point that you have to uh, focus uh, jointly on the historical uh, dimension and the civil society dimension then a quick rejoinder to uh, to Roberto. In fact, uh, the yellow-green uh, terminology has also been used by other scholars. For instance, there's a special issue of a journal, uh, Contemporary Italian Politics, uh, edited by James Newell, uh, the yellow-green government one year on. Of course, these labels, uh, green, black, uh, yellow, have some subjective dimension in, in, in them. So. Uh, yellow is the color of classical liberalism, of German classical liberalism, so something with which uh, the Five Star Movement is perhaps not so much uh, uh, not so much related. Black may be the color of uh, classic Christian democracy in Germany and Austria. And as regards uh, the, 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 the old league, the new league, uh, uh, there was a, an important book by two political scientists, uh, Passarelli and Tuorto, who highlight that uh, the uh, northern card, the arguments based on northern autonomy, northern secession, may be a reserve card for the League if uh, the um, sovereignist, uh, pro-Russian shift uh, ultimately fails. Uh, so uh, I think there is also some ambiguity in this. Uh, finally, there is a question from uh, Adriano Martufi. Uh, personally, I would stay with uh, the label constitutional democracy because I think of it, at, at least from a continental viewpoint, as uh, um, 
able to grasp uh, the social dimension, as you put it, uh, the uh, soziale und demokratische Rechtsstaat, so the social dimension and also the pluralist dimension, so the idea that uh, the constitutional the, the, the constitutional order uh, protects a number of uh, uh, possibly conflicting constitutional goods. And I think that the idea of constitutional democracy is uh, more um, promising, more useful than the one of liberal democracy in this respect. And I also think uh, that uh, it... Um, it is more useful if you focus on the relationship between government and society. Again, the issue of um, social forces, civil society returns. So uh, if you think of it uh, as one of uh, mutual engagement, so to speak, I think that the notion of uh, constitutional democracy is uh, more uh, promising. Thank you. Thanks very much, Giacomo. And uh, um, now it's the uh, turn of Mattei to, to respond to the comments. He has already intervened uh, shortly, but uh, this is the occasion for more uh, extensive remark in five minutes. Thank you. I, I wish I'd have 50 minutes uh, in, instead of just five, because uh, the comments were uh, indeed great. Uh, great uh, Paul speaking about the, the, the necessary refocusing or even focusing more in, in some other parts of the research agenda. Roberto uh, specifying the importance of the European dimension and Armen uh, drawing our attention to the global dimension. I think I will start with Armen and um, I will be somehow bound to share his pessimism, which might be unfortunately also substantiated by the actual facts in the contemporary uh, contemporary global affairs. Uh, I think that indeed uh, we are witnessing something big. Uh, we are witnessing, we are living in, 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 in special times where we are transiting from modernity into postmodernity. And this is bringing, and this paradigm shift which is occurring is indeed uh, pulling from our societies, bringing from our societies out the, the most negative sentiments and practices uh, that we can afford. So I agree. I mean, we, we, we live in the world of irrationalism, the world in which we fear difference. Uh, we, we live in the world where the middle class is frustrated and poly good politicians know how to appeal to that. Uh, if it's an irrational world, of course, there are also plots. And indeed, there is a lack of ideology. But if there is a lack of ideology, that means that essentially anything goes. And what really matters, as Humpty Dumpty would put it, who is the most powerful or who is actually uh, in the power. And now I think if, if the situation is like that, uh, this poses a question for us. This raises a question for us as what are we expected to do as academics? And I think this really is an important question because what I have, and it's of course my own observation, and I, I might be guilty of exaggeration and partiality, is my subjective perspective, but I do not have any other one than my own subjective one. I think that in this, as the world has gone irrational, crazy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, over the last 10 or more years, I think also the academics have descended into the political fields. Many academics themselves have become politicians and have to a certain extent abandoned the traditional role of the academic, which is the role of, of a critical observer, of somebody who would like to understand with scientific tools that we possess, or at least proto-scientific tools that we possess, who would like to understand what is actually going on, to describe as accurately as possible what's going on, and to explain first to myself as an academic, and then to a broader uh, community of peers of what, what is actually taking place in the society nowadays. I think that by the fact that ac academics have descended, uh, deliberately or not, uh, 
consciously or subconsciously into a political field, into, into these political fights, they have basically been made, put themselves up to grabs to the political glass and they have been, they have been put, uh, they have been involved into a war that they cannot win because the politicians properly so-called uh, and populists uh, will always uh, prevail. So I think that's one important point that I'd, li I'd like to finish it. If I still have one minute, I'd also like to uh, uh, applaud to what uh, Paul has said. I think it's of utmost importance uh, in the European Union, and when we speak about the European integration, that we do not focus just on the legal dimension. In the book that we as lawyers, me and Gerne, we are lawyers, and the, the book that we wrote, of course, is a book that lawyers can write, but I think that we tried as much to invest also in the sociological dimension. Because I think it is there in the sociological dimension how things are actually done, how a, how a given constitution actually performs according to its standards or it doesn't. So this material constitution, the economic relationships, the question where power actually lies, who wields this power and how, I think this needs to be brought into the forefront of, of our academic uh, attention. And finally, of course, History matters a lot because we have come where we presently are due to certain historical path dependence. Something has happened in this historical trajectory that has brought us to this, uh, to this point. So I think it is really necessary to reassess this, uh, this history, to have another critical glimpse at it, uh, to, to, to understand it better, because only on the, this on the basis of this better understanding, we will be able to come up with better normative prescriptions and to secure uh, and to defend the viability of the uh, constitutional democracy, uh, which I think is the model uh, that ought to be preserved even in this uh, postmodern times where all certainty seems to be uh, dissipating. Thanks very much, Matei. I don't see any other questions from uh, the audience, so maybe I just want to give the opportunity to our discussant for a quick reaction, if they want, uh, to, to what has been said, um, if they uh, are willing to do so. Let's see, you are not obliged to, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy to, I, it just, I'm a bit embarrassed because of the richness of the the discussion. I mean, um, I found some of the remarks really, really important, like uh, Giuseppe mentioning the whole issue of uh, what the Germans so wonderfully call Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, which, uh, according to uh, um, Giuseppe, is missing in the Italian case. And I think, I think he's right. There are too many myths around still about uh, the, the the end of the war, but also of, of fascism itself as a regime. Uh, so that I think is a very important point. Um, also what uh, uh, Matej just uh, mentioned, and uh, of course I couldn't agree uh, more. Uh, just one uh, uh, point of dissonance, um, Arman said that there's a lack of ideology, uh, and there I'm not entirely sure. I mean, in my recent work, I've really tried to be comparative as much as I, uh, I'm able to. Uh, and I, I believe if you look throughout the, the European context and you link uh, Orban with Kaczynski, with Salvini, with Le Pen, with uh, the new rising populist uh, Thierry Baudet in, in the Netherlands, for instance, there are common threats that have a certain ideological dimension to them, I think. And I, I tend to refer to them as conservatism, a particular kind of conservatism that, that, that has a particular view of the community and liberal uh, human rights in particular are often portrayed by these people as, as threatening that community. And that is, I think, one of the core points these populists try to make, which is not completely irrational, uh, but it's, uh, it, it needs to put in the right perspective. And that's what populists often don't do. They, they blow up a certain critique of on human rights out of proportion. Um, and so, well, that's just a... Uh, a dissonant point. Uh, the, for the rest, I found uh, really uh, the remarks in this second round really of uh, enormously high quality. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And um, maybe let's see if Roberto uh, 
as some remarks. No, I would like especially to thank Mattei because uh, for for what he said about the need to complement uh, the legal perspective with the sociological one in the sense that uh, as a political philosopher, I, I tend to uh, agree with what uh, Bobbio said about rights, that rights uh, are always the results uh, of uh, of a fight, of a political uh, uh, fight for the recognition of those rights. And now one of the problem we have uh, is that uh, uh, the new rights are rights that cannot be guaranteed only at the national level. At the same time, we don't have a polity at the European and at the global level where we can have normal polities to get certain rights recognized. And this is true for the right uh, of uh, uh, movement of people. Today we have uh, the right of movement for money. Capitals can move around the world, but people cannot. Uh, we and for the recognition of the traditional human rights uh, all over the world, and also of trying to get them recognized by fleeing where they are not, which is uh, a right that uh, uh, is increasingly challenged even by in, in Western U in world and in Europe. So uh, the, the that issue I think is crucial for uh, all scholars. And uh, I also agree very much with Matei's point about the responsibility as academic to um, try to contribute to the debate and to the public debate uh, uh, on all these issues because our society is running at deep risk. Eventually, this is also the reason why with, uh, with Cesare we launched uh, Euractiv Italy. Uh, it was uh, over two years that Euractiv was absent from uh, Italy which uh, with all its shortcoming and problems is still the third uh, largest country in, in, in the EU. And, uh, and we believe that it was uh, a challenge worth taking to contribute to the information and the public debate on European issues in our country. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Armen. Some final remarks. Yes, Christina, thank you very much. And since time is quite limited, we have only a few minutes left. I would simply want to respond to Paul's very good question, by the way. And I think this is a question that needs further research and has to be um, really addressed more in the literature. But my first reaction would be, of course, everything can be labeled as ideology. Anti-ideology is, in a way, ideology. Of course, most of the regimes which we are dealing with are conservative, but this is why I said I refuse to really, really label uh, uh, Trump's ideology as conservatism or as republicanism, because it is not in its classical meaning. What I'm saying, they are not ideologi ideological, these systems, they do not fit into any classical definition of ideologies. Take Orban. Actually, he has a famous article in which he says, I am a Democrat. I'm simply not a liberal, liberal, liberal Democrat. I'm an illiberal, illiberal Democrat. Putin has an ideology in that sense, too. It's called sovereign democracy. Once he had this uh, ideology entirely presented as the ideology of his uh, regime, of his uh, government, etc., as Roberto put very perfectly, and I agree to that, I subscribe to that, illiberal democracy is not democracy, and I believe so. And I also believe so that sovereign democracy of Putin is not democracy, and this is how the majority of experts in the field also think. And uh, by the way, if you also take the perspective of uh, emerging democracies, smaller democracies or struggling democracies, I could even say that some of them are even more liberal in their nature. My, my, my native Armenia is in that state. So populism that is currently, this is how I label my government currently, it is response to anti-democratic and corrupt practices of the past. So in a way, the entire ambition of this government is to build democracy, but populism is the way that currently, and this is due to also the nature of the protest movement that they believe democracy should be. But again, ideologically, they are rather on the side of democracy. But I refuse to understand this as democracy in its pure, real terms. That much. Thank you very much. 
Thanks a lot, Armen. And uh, thank you all. We are reaching the, the conclusion of this webinar. So thank you all to all the speakers, the discussants for their important reflections, also the audience. Um, uh, it seems that this Italian-Slovenian collaboration is very fruitful, actually a European collaboration at large. Uh, and I hope that new initiatives can uh, be organized soon. Um, so do join me for a virtual applause uh, of uh, our speakers and be ready for new events to be uh, circulated and promoted soon. Uh, next week, uh, uh, STALS uh, and Diritti Comparati respectively are organizing uh, other webinars on the future of European integration in Italian on the 15th and on the 18th. So um, more information will be uh, circulated soon. Thanks again for uh, your attention.